Now, a little bit of background info on the Song of Solomon, also known as the Song of Songs. And the reason is, if you remember from previous books, we found out that Solomon was a man of wisdom. He was uh, a great writer of poetry, and he wrote songs. It says 1,005 songs, but this is the best one. It's called the Song of Songs, the greatest of his 1,005 songs. And since his name's in the title, and it's listed seven times within the text, it's a pretty unanimous decision that Solomon is indeed the author of this book. Uh, it goes back then to the 10th century B.C., during his reign, from 970 to 931 B.C. Uh, this is the third week in a row we've had Solomon. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and now Song of Solomon. And, you know, besides being a, a, a man of great wisdom and being... Uh, a writer of poetry and songs. He also was an expert in botany and zoology. You see that in the text of this, he lists 21 different plant varieties, 15 different animals. And he uh, awfully would, would go out and teach uh, botany and zoology and other things, uh, general science to people as well, a great man of wisdom. Uh, but there's something about this book that uh, is controversial. And so I want to look at like the unique controversial uh, aspects of Song of Solomon. Over the centuries, many have debated why this is even in the canon of Old Testament scripture. I want to read a portion from Matthew Henry, the great Reformed Puritan theologian, what he had to say about Song of Solomon. He said, I believe in both the divine origin and spiritual explanation of this book. But Song of Solomon is very different from the songs of his father David. Here is no mention of the name of God. It is never quoted in the New Testament. We do not find it in either any expression of natural religion or godly devotion on the one hand or any marks of direct revelation on the other. It seems as hard as any part of Scripture to be made a fragrance of life, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 2.16. In fact, those who come to read it with ungodly minds and corrupt desires... It is in danger of being made a smell of death. The Jewish teachers, therefore, advised their young people not to read it until they were 30 years old. So they would not abuse what is purest or most sacred and thereby kindle the flames of lust with the fires of heaven. He quite a strong statement about Song of Solomon. He finishes with this. He says, as many of David's songs are at the level of capacity of the lowliest people, and there are shallows in them in which a lamb may wade, so this song of Solomon's will exercise the capacities of the most learned, and it has depths in which an elephant may swim. So he acknowledges to us that it is a difficult book to understand sometimes. The difficulty described really is in the method used to interpret it. And therein lies the problem. Is it just an allegory? We think of Pilgrim's Progress. Who has read Pilgrim's Progress? You other side says, there's a man there named Christian, or Pilgrim, and he lives in the city of destruction. He's on his way to the celestial city. He meets some people along the way. Um, think of worldly wise men and talkative and all those different people he meets, hypocrisy. He gets off on Bypath Meadow. And so we're looking at actually allegory, taking from the text the meaning of the Christian walk. Okay, that would be allegory. Uh, some interpret this as lyrically as a song. Do we look at it dramatically like a group of poems? Or is it like it seems maybe just literal? It's about the story of love between a man and a woman. It really depends on how you interpret it. So let's look at some methods of interpretation. Um, as we mentioned, as Matthew Henry mentioned, there's really no doctrine here per se. There's nothing that talks about uh, theology. And so we're not going to take it and go through it like we have some of the other books. But let's look at some of the methods of which it's been interpreted. The first would be allegorical. And this was favored really through most of early Jewish and Christian history. Up until about the middle of the 19th century, the allegory method was the most favored. And basically what they're trying to do was to find spiritual meaning behind some of the descriptive language concerning the love relationship between a man and a woman. That was what the allegory was trying to determine. According to Jewish tradition, the love expressed between man and woman actually reflects the love of God for Israel. And we see that in the Old Testament. We see several passages using the human relationship of love as a metaphor for Israel's relationship with God. 
Isaiah 54, 4 to 8, Jeremiah 2, 1 to 2. You'll see that. There's also been some Christian theologians who have favored the allegorical method in the past. You know, some of these names you remember. Origen, Athanasius, Augustine, Luther, even Calvin interpreted this book that way. Um, most of them looked at it as conveying the love between Christ and his church. But is that the proper way to interpret this book? The great disparity between the Jewish and Christian understanding, well, we've just seen that already. One says it's the love of God for Israel. One says it's the love of Christ for his church. And then looking at the subjective nature of how it's interpreted, these are what most scholars believe to be the greatest drawback to that method. And when I talk about subjective nature of looking at it, let's look at an example of interpretation, how it differed between different theologians. Um, chapter 1, verse 13 says, <clears throat> this is the woman speaking in the love poem. In chapter 1, it says, My love is a sachet of myrrh to me, spending the night between my breasts. All right? <laughs> so we look at the 11th century. We had two Jewish biblical commentators, Rashi and Ibn Ezra. They said this phrase refers to God tabernacling over the cherubs that covered the Ark of the Covenant. That was their interpretation of that. The same verse Theologian Cyril, Cyril of Alexandria in the 5th century A.D. proposed the verse referred to the two testaments of the law. And then Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, more of a Catholic Christian in the 12th century, believed the verse referred to the crucifixion of Christ, which strengthens the believer in sorrow and joy. That's what he distinguished from that verse. So you see where there's some confusion there. So the allegorical method was hmm, kind of questionable. Uh, it kind of was weakened by the fact that nobody could agree on what it meant. And plus the fact, if you just read it from the text, there's nothing that would tell us that there's allegory in it. It's basically a love story. And so let's look at that a little bit. Um, something else. Many of the scholars believed that the explicit language would be an inappropriate way to display the love of God for his people. That's one of the other drawback of the method. But I'm going to throw it under the bus totally. The allegorical method does have some things that we'll look at. We'll come back and look at this at the end, and we'll get some benefit from that, really from looking at metaphors and signs, right? but not from a direct allegorical interpretation. The, uh, the second method used after allegorical would be dramatic. Dramatic. And this is interpretation that involves the use of three characters. Solomon, the Shulamite woman, and someone they call the Shulamite shepherd. And this became popular in the 19th century, and still today is proposed by, there's a couple of uh, professors up at uh, Wheaton College, Andrew Hill and John Walton, still propose this. Listen to what they say. In this interpretation, the Shulamite maiden loves the Shulamite shepherd, but Solomon comes along and adds this woman to his harem and tries to woo her. This takes place from 1 verse 2 all the way to 7 verse 9, chapter 7 verse 9. She ultimately rejects King Solomon, chapter 7 verse 10 to 8 verse 4. And finally, the Shulamite maiden and the shepherd lover are reunited at the end of chapter 8. And that's the dramatic interpretation. Uh, you may find it hard, if you look at that, to figure out where that came from, or to even pinpoint the point in the Scripture where you would find one character and the other. So the dramatic interpretation, very limited, but it is one of the ways that's interpreted. Next would be the lyrical method. The lyrical method just says, hey, you know, this is love poems. We can look at them. We can read them. There's not really any plot here. There's no direction to them. Let's just look at them as love poetry, like you'd sit down and have a reading. And that way, uh, it's basically just about um, the love between a man and a woman in a conjugal relationship that's established by God. Let's talk about that. That's the lyrical method. But finally, then, we come to the fourth, and the one that's most used today is the literal method. So we had allegorical, we had um, dramatic, we have lyrical, and then we have the literal method. And most scholars today believe, looked at it from literal sense, uh, the truth is it clearly does demonstrate 
the joyful and mysterious love between a man and a woman within the covenant of marriage. It's most likely, and this is, to get a little historical here, it's most likely a, a love poem that Solomon wrote to his favorite wife. Now you say, wait a minute, Gary. <laughs> Solomon had a bunch of them. He did. And it says in the text, though, in six, I think chapter 6, verse 13, that at this point in time, he had 60 wives and 80 concubines, or maybe it's the other way around. And he was still pretty young because he ends up with 700 wives and 300 concubines. So this is early in his career, if you will. But here's what happened. Uh, you may remember in 1 Kings chapter 1, when David was old and he couldn't keep warm at night, and they went out and found this beautiful young maiden to lie with him and keep him warm. Her name was Abishag. And there's no relationship there other than she would keep him warm. Kind of a strange custom, I know, but that's what happened. Well, David had a son named Solomon, of course, through Bathsheba, but he had another son named Adonijah. And while David was old, Adonijah went and took the commander of the army, and he took uh, Abiathar the priest, and he went and he made himself king. He proclaimed that he was the king. And when the people under David and Solomon found out, they went and told King David, and he went and had Solomon anointed to be king. And so Adonijah then was fearful for his life. His younger brother is Solomon, but dad said he's the king, and so there's a problem. So Adonijah then goes into the, uh, the tent and grabs on to the horns of the altar. And says, so, you know, have mercy on me. I'm sorry. <laughs> have mercy on me. And so Solomon finds out. He goes, you know, as long as he behaves himself, I'll let him live. Well, after David dies, Adonijah then goes to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, who was the queen, and ask her to ask Solomon if she could have Abishag to be his wife. Well, Solomon didn't take that too well. And he went and he had Adonijah executed. Because that would be a, if he had the commander of the, of the armies and he had the priests and then he gets the king's former maiden, he's got all the power. And so there was no more of that. So what happens then, what we believe happens is that Solomon then took this woman named Abishag. And you'll see in the text in 1 Kings, it says she's a woman of Shunam, a Shunammite with an N. And in the text of Song of Solomon, you'll see Shulamite. The Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, made those the same. They said that was a, a, a problem with the text. It's actually Shunammite. They don't know what Shulamite even is. And so the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation, said this is the same person. So Abishag is the Shunammite woman that we see in the text of Song of Solomon. So with that context, let's look at a little outline. It's pretty neat what Solomon did here. He made it what's called um, a chiastic, which means it's symmetrical. So we look at it, it's, it's like a poem. So we have like A, B, C, and then D would be the central portion. And we go back and have C, B, A. So the A's line up, the B's line up, and the C's line up. So it starts with A, ends with A in chapter 8 at the end. And so I'll show you how that works. Um, the opening words of mutual love and desire, so 1 verse 2 to 2 verse 7, that would be our A. And so we have throughout, you'll notice these mentioning of daughters of Jerusalem or daughters of Zion. This would be like the chorus that would be singing in the background, and giving them suggestions. B would be the young man's invitation to the young woman. To verse 8 to verse 17. C, the young woman's nighttime search for her lover. That's chapters 3, verse 1 to 5. And then our D, which is in the center, which is the, the, the whole highlight here. D is the wedding day. So that's chapter 3, verse 6 to chapter 5, verse 1. And in Hebrew literature, it's not always chronological. The wedding may have been before all this activity, but they put it here to make the point. All right, so now we're going back the other direction. The, the other C coming back would be, again, the young woman's nighttime search. 5 verse 2 to chapter 7 verse 11. And then young woman's invitation to the young man. So B up above was the young man's invitation to the woman. Now it's the young woman's invitation to the man. That's chapter 7 verse 12 to chapter 8 verse 4. And then it ends with our final A is the closing words of 
mutual love and desire. 8, verse 5 to verse 14. Isn't that neat how he did that? And you can kind of follow, see that flowing through. And really, if you take this literally, it is just, it's a love poem that he wrote to his favorite wife. And whether it's all factual or true, we don't know, but the, the language is, uh, is, uh, tells us a good bit. So let's look at some of the themes from Song of Solomon. I guess it's best to look at, to understand it as a commentary on the establishment of marriage from Genesis 1 and 2. You might even say it amplifies the first words of Adam when he saw Eve that brought to him. Remember what he said? It goes at last. Bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. He was excited. He had someone to share his life with. And that's what we're looking at here. This book can also be seen as a, a corrective against all forms of sexual perversion. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, here it is. God's created sex, and it's not evil when it's enjoyed within the parameters he's established, the marriage covenant. It's not evil. Some of that, that, that old thought that kept the uh, interpreters from looking at it literally was, comes from the Greek philosophers. The Greek philosophers looked at physical matter as evil, and that which is the soul was good. In other words, they said things like... Um, Physical pleasures are evil, and they're to be avoided for the good of the soul. That's Greek thought. And so this Greek philosophy kind of hung over, and in the 2nd and 3rd century, there was one of the, a couple of heresies in the, in the Christian church over that. One's called docetism. The docetics uh, didn't believe in the, the humanity of Christ. They said there's no way God came in a fleshly body because that's evil. And then there was Gnosticism, too, that believed it was all about wisdom and there was nothing physical about Christ, which means if you didn't come in the flesh, which means he didn't die on the cross, which means he didn't resurrect. So how can that be a Christ at all? That was Docetism. Those were all shot down. But that's where that comes from, that ancient Greek thought. In reality, though, Song of Solomon, the language is not lewd or crude. It's actually uh, the man and woman display to each other integrity, and commitment and faithfulness, those are all desirable qualities in a spouse. Okay, that's good. Think about this. Song of Solomon has a place in Scripture, perhaps due to the biblical mandate of Genesis 1, 26 to 31. What happened there? God had made this world. He said, everything is good. And he put man and woman in his paradise. And he said, be fruitful Multiply, subdue it. You're in charge of everything here. Another thing, without the Song of Solomon, the Bible really could be looked at as incomplete. I mean, we have prohibitions against sexual morality in Scripture all the way through the Old Testament and New Testament. Look at Paul's letters. He's always writing about it. It's number one in his list, avoid sexual morality. And we have things that tell us in the Old Testament about what is considered illicit sexual behavior. But this book then is seen um, as positive instructions on how sex is to be enjoyed and appreciated under what God has given us. Does that make sense? You can see that, right? And so we look at it this way. Um, something to think about, too. I mentioned earlier Solomon had 700 wives, 300 concubines. But God's plan was monogamy. God's plan was for one man and one woman. And the fact that Solomon and even David had multiple wives does not change the truth that God had intended. That's their sin, right? That doesn't make it right because they had those. Sometimes the kings, because they were king, could, uh, took those um, pleasures to themselves. But it doesn't make it right. And I said earlier that we'd come back and look at the allegorical method. So I want, to think, I want you to think about a couple of things as we bring this to a close. Um, when you read Song of Solomon, you can sense the desire for intimacy intended for men and women. This was assumed when he placed Adam and Eve in this garden paradise. He assumed their intimacy. That was going to happen. Be fruitful and multiply. And even though you might look at this book as Allegory. It may be a bit off target to do that. It does help to illustrate, and that's the key here. It helps us to illustrate 
the love of God for His people that we see in the Old Testament and the love of Christ for His church that we see in the New Testament. So marriage then, not allegorical, we're not going through and picking the pieces out of Song of Solomon saying this means this and this means that, but overall it illustrates for us the positive view of marriage. In the Old Testament we see, like Ezekiel 16, Hosea chapters 1 and 3, the relationship that God wants with His people, those who love Him and those who worship Him. And we come, Isaiah 62, verse 5. This is great. The prophet, speaking of Jerusalem, says this, For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Old Testament prophet Isaiah. So you can see that this, this concept of marriage between God and His people does have something to say to us. If we go to the New Testament, we clearly see wedding ceremony and language of marriage used as a metaphor for God's redemptive purposes. Very key that we see that. John 3, 29 and 30, John the Baptist. You've read this before, but listen to it in light of what we've talked about this morning. Speaking of Christ, he says, The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. In other words, the bridegroom is here. It's time for me to back out of the way and let him do his thing because he is the groom. And it's a passage that's very important for us to hear. Ephesians 5, 31 to 32. This is great. Listen to what Paul wrote. He goes back to Genesis 2 to make his point. He makes it very clear. Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. Paul writes, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Therefore, what I'm saying, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying it refers to Christ and the church. Isn't that great? So he connects the, the story of marriage in Genesis to Christ and the church for us. And so we take that from Song of Solomon and we can see. If we go to Revelation 19, Revelation 19, verses 7 and 9, we get a glimpse of this mystery that Paul was talking about. Listen to what it says. It says, Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. And so we look forward to that day, the marriage supper of the Lamb. The Song of Solomon is without a doubt, a unique piece of literature. Difficult to understand, even for brilliant scholars like Matthew Henry. Like, what is this about? And you may even say to yourself, why is this even in the Bible? But hopefully now, after seeing the background and seeing the different ways to interpret it, you can see God's true understanding for marriage and His true purpose for the church being known as the Bride of Christ. Hopefully that's helpful. Any questions or comments?